Hello everyone. Today we're going to be reading from the history of the town of Rye, New Hampshire. This book was written let's see, by Langdon B. Parsons in 1935. I'm going to be reading chapter 8, chapter 9, Inns, Taverns, and Hotels. <clears throat> Lexicographers make a distinction between the inn and the tavern, the former being described as a house for the lodging and entertaining of travelers, and the latter as a home licensed to sell intoxicating liquors in small quantities to be drank on the spot in the discretion, or lack thereof, of the purchaser, the tavern innkeeper, or the taverner, being also required to purchase lodging for guests, and shelter, and fodder for animals. The distinction seems not to have been very closely observed in this country by the early settlers, an inn and a tavern having apparently been the same thing and inn-holders and tavern-keepers synonymous terms. Perhaps because all the early inn-holders sold liquor, in addition to providing shelter and food for man and beast, the more pretentious term hotel is of comparatively modern use to designate a public house of entertainment, the first inner tavern in Rye, of which any record has been found was the center of the town, and was kept by Robinson Trefferin, probably a corruption of Trefepin, of which name there were many residents on both sides of the Piscataqua at the time. Trefferin came to Rye from Great Ireland in 1747, or 48, and in those years probably erected the house which he conducted as a tavern until September 1756, when he sold it to Simon, Peter, and Benjamin Garwin for 2,426 pounds. The Garwins managed the place jointly for three years, at the end of which time Benjamin bought the interest of his brothers for 1,000 pounds, and thereafter, for nearly 40 years, conducted the business alone. For many years, his tavern was the place, was the most popular place in town, and not only on weekdays, but on Sundays as well. It was the resort for the minister and his parishioners to get their toddy. The main house is still standing. It is the building on Washington Road at the center, directly opposite the head of Central Road. As some of its heavy oak timbers are apparently as sound as when they were put together when they were put in a century and a half ago. The place is now owned by the heirs of R. R. Higgins of Boston. Benjamin Seagull owned the ma- and managed the inn for several years prior to 1755. It was situated on what is now Wallace Road a short distance towards the sea from Sagamore Road, and near the location of the house now occupied by Joseph Langdon Seavey. Indeed, ju- judging from the position of the ancient elms now standing near Mr. Seavey's house from the most westerly one, of which large, heavy sign of the inn hung, decayed pieces in the trunk, showing where the fastenings were driven. It is probable that Mr. Seavey's residence occupies the exact site of the inn. Schedule sold the property to Ebenezer Wallace and the latter. In 1758, sold it to Amos Seavey, the place having remained in the Seavey name since that time. It ceased to be an inn when sold by Seagel. John Loverin was an inn holder in 1756-57, his inn being located east of the meeting house on the road to Portsmouth. He sold the place to Captain Samuel Levin, 
He conducted it as an end for a very short time. Paul Randall was proprietor and manager of the inn and West Bride on Washington Road, between the present Grove and West Grove for some years. I, my daughter Olivia, <laughs> say hello. Hello. Paul Randall was proprietor and manager of the inn and West Drive on Washington Road between the present Grove Road and West Roads for some years prior to January 7, 1763, on which date he and his wife Abigail transferred his inn, barn, shop, and 19 acres of land to Joseph Levette, sorry, Levy, who continued the house as an inn until his death about a year later. Abraham Levy of Rye, former administered on his brother's estate, and from that time himself conducted the tavern until it was destroyed by fire in 1787. John Carroll, in 1794, kept a small store a short distance eastward from the center, about where the present Portsmouth Road commences, where the Ardent was retailed. Whether there was as much of this article sold in Rye at the time as in the neighboring town of Northampton, there is no record. But probably the amount was not widely different in proportion to population. Reverend Dr. Jonathan French, in his half-century anniversary discourse, delivered in Northampton in 1850, says that 40 hogsheads of the fiery New England rum was sold in a single year in one store of that small town. And besides, some of the farmers brought back from towns in the vicinity where they had been to market, where they had been to market their produce, in many cases a barrel, and in a few cases a hogshead of the liquor and deposit it in their cellars. But this does not imply that the people of Rye or of Northampton were any more given to indulgence and strong drink than the residents of other towns. Practically everybody at that time made use of the stimulants, and there was nothing disreputable in their so doing. And men who never took a glass of liquor were few and far between, and probably were regarded as cranks. Drunkenness, but too often indulged in, was indeed regarded as discreditable, but moderate drinking was not, and what was regarded as moderate drinking in those days would not pass muster as such now. Temperate movements, on the basis of moral persuasion, were a product of the early part of the last century, and the prohibitory law is now only about a half a century old. Derived from its position, relative to other towns, did not require many inns in its early days. It was aside from the line of travel between towns in the interior of the state and Portsmouth, and after the establishing of stage lines, it was still way off to one side, so the once noted stage taverns were never required in the town. The principal business of the Rye Inns was probably the dispensing of liquid refreshments to the townspeople and the providing of food and lodging for occasional travelers and their animals, but an incidental. The next chapter is chapter 9. This is Rye as a Summer Resort. To its location, away from any line of general public travel, which made its inns and taverns in the early days of local interest and importance only, the rye of the present day is undoubtedly indebted, to a great extent, for its popularity and fame as one of the most noted summer resorts in New England, attracting many hundreds of visitors annually from all parts of the country, and having a numerous and steadily increasing colony of summer residents whose private summer cottages scattered all along the six miles of ocean front from Odeorns Point to Northampton Line add greatly to the taxable property of the town, not a few of which are such size and cost that would have won them the title of mansions, instead of cottages, 
century or less ago. Not that Rye lacks natural attractions and advantages. On the contrary, it possesses many of great ones. Its shoreline is largely composed of sandy beaches, divided from each other by rocky points jutting out into the Atlantic, with outlying rocks and ledges, which dangerous though they are to navigators unfortunate enough to be in their vicinity in times of fog or storm, afford during and after a storm magnificent surf effects that cannot fail to arouse the awe as well as the admiration of the lover of nature who views them from a vantage point of safety on shore. These beaches, sloping very gradually down to and far under the sea, furnish a low tide, a broad expanse of firm sand for strolling for pleasure to drive, for pleasure driving, and at all times a tide for sea bathing. Such sea bathing as for safety can be found at few seaside resorts, there being nothing similar to the dangerous pussies that are common at the beach. Nothing similar to the dangerous pussies that are common along the beach, along Long Island and New Jersey coasts. That might be one to look up. <laughs> uh, has something to do with undertow. Uh, it was a along the along the Long Island and New Jersey coasts, and very seldom any undertow. Never, never excepting on rare occasions for a tide or two after a storm. Exceptional severity and duration. Seven miles off to the southeastward, a group of rocky islands known as the Isles of Shoals stand up boldly out of the sea, and all the waterborne commerce of the neighboring port of Portsmouth, which during the summer season is by no means inconsiderable, passes <clears throat> in plain view of the various beaches. Back from the seashore town is, is pleasing in appearance and restful in its attractiveness. There are no wonders of nature that astonish or appall the beholder, but everywhere well-kept roads, well-cultivated farms and neat farm buildings, schoolhouses and churches, by their exterior conditions and surroundings, afford evidence that they are not neglected, broken down fences and overthrown walls are rarely to be seen. While shade trees Thrifty and moderately extensive orchards and flower gardens in which modern floral favorites mingle with flowers such as our grandmothers used to tend and admire are visible on every hand. The cattle in the pastures and the horses on the roads are generally of good quality and good condition. The people one meets of intelligent appearance and evidently self-respecting. In short, rye in all of its aspects presents the best feature of typical thrifty New England town, where honest toil is honored and usually secures a fair recompense, where the church, the schoolhouse, and the town meeting are still important institutions in which people to the manor born continue to regard as the best place in the world in which to live all year through, in which hundreds of others regard as the best place in the country in which to pass a month or a summer of leisure. <clears throat> Rye as a summer resort has a social atmosphere differing widely from the prevailing at either Newport or Coney Island. Neither fashions nor fakers rule supreme. It is essentially a resting place for those wearied with the ceaseless whirl of society or the cares of business. Society functions, of course there are, but few of the regular summer visitors regard them as the only essential to life. As incidentals, they are acceptable, often brilliant, but they are only incidentals. Bathing, driving out of doors, uh, bathing, driving out of door sports for the younger people, trips to the many other summer resorts and places of historic interest within easy reach, 
and formal evening dances at the hotels, some boating and fishing while away the hours, and for the ladies who enjoy shopping, and for a lady does not, Portsmouth is but a short drive distant, distance, and though Portsmouth is not one of the great cities, it has not a few good stores with large and well-selected stocks, and where the summer visitor, whether from Rye or elsewhere, is a welcome call. The summer colony of Rye is not wholly composed of people of wealth and fashion. Many persons of moderate means have cottages here, and hundreds of others pass a few weeks each or the entire season at the various boarding houses which cater to such patronage and all contribute to the general welfare and prosperity of the town. The hotels and large boarding houses furnish the farmers with a market for their summer produce right at their doors. And this patronage, patronage is of importance enough to be carefully catered to. A vast sum of money is annually expended in the town by the summer visitors. And the benefit of this is felt directly or indirectly by every visitor, sorry, every resident of the town. The Atlantic House has a good claim to be considered the first summer hotel of Rye, although not erected with that purpose in view, it having been built before there was any such thing as a season of summer travel, as the term is now understood. Part of it formerly stood on the south side of the highway, nearly opposite its present location. It was a large, commodious farmhouse, and was also conducted by its owner and occupant, Elder Ephraim Philbert, as a home of entertainment for parties who came from up the country with their teams to buy fish at the numerous fish houses along the beach near at hand. These visitors came mostly during the summer and fall, but the visits were made for business ends only, recreation and rest not being thought of. The house was moved across the road to the present site of the Atlantic House. Additions made to it, and the enlarged structure opened up to the public about 1846 by Elder Philbrick's son, John C. Philbrick. Extensive enlargements have since been been from time to time made in the rear. But the main body of the building remains now in practically the same condition as it was more than 50 years ago. The first Farragut House was erected by John C. Philbrick about 1864, and during the summer of 1866, Admiral Farragut was a guest of the hotel. The house was conducted by Mr. Philbrick up till the time of his death in 1869, after which it was managed by Mrs. Filbert and her son Frank A. Filbert. The building was burned about midnight on April 18, 1882. The President Farragut was erected on the same site with all the speed practical, practical and opened to the public in 1883. It was conducted by Frank A. Filbert up to the time of his death since which time it has been managed by Frank A. Hall. It is the largest of the summer hotels of the town. The first ocean house at Genesee Beach was a comparatively small building, put up in 1848 by Jonathan Rollins Genesee, whose brother Job Genesee made extensive additions to it and opened it the following year. He continued it its management with success until it was destroyed by fire on June 22, 1862. Mr. Jenis at once erected a much larger and more pretentious hotel, which, under the management of Job Jenis and son, quickly became one of the most famous summer resorts along the New England coast, a position it retained until it burnt to the ground on April 3, 1873. At the time of its destruction, no summer hostelry to the eastward of Boston was more widely known or enjoyed a higher reputation, and the townspeople hoped and expected that a third ocean house would soon arise over its ashes. But this never came to pass. For thirty years over the last ocean house, 
was burned. The Ocean House Grove, as it continued to be called, was a favorite resort for picnic parties. The grove being supplied with tables, benches, cooking facilities, etc. for their accommodation. But recently, this land has been laid out into the streets and buildings. And probably neither picnic parties nor summer hotel will have place hereafter. Not many rods westerly from the Ocean House, but on the opposite side of the road, Mr. Oliver Philbrook in 1853 built a surf house, which was conducted as a summer hotel until October 22, 1872, when it was destroyed by fire and has never been replaced. Easterly from the surf house site, and nearly opposite the location of the Ocean House, Mr. Carr Leavitt in 1853 built the Washington House, which was con conducted as a summer hotel until recently, when it was remodeled by his son, Mr. John E. Leavitt, into an apartment house, the first of the kind in the town. It is still a part of the town's accommodation for summer visitors, but for families only, the parties engaging in the season, transient pa patrons are not being received. Foss Beach, Sandy Beach, of Morrill's plan of ride, there was at one time a summer hotel of moderate size called the Prospect House. The date of its erection we have not discovered, but it was burned on July 10, 1862, and not rebuilt. In 1869, the Seaview House was built by Mr. George G. Nugent at the junction of Central and South Roads. And since that time, he has managed it with the assistance of his son, Gil Gilman M. Nugent. The Ocean Wave House at North Rye Beach, which is shown on Morrill's plan as a part of Sandy Beach and is not so far north as Wallace Sands Beach, was built in 1879 by Henry Knox. It is very near the shore and so situated and so planned that every sleeping room has a window from which a more or less extensive view of some part of the ocean can be had. But this beach and the Concord Point, which makes it its northern boundary there, are many summer cottages. And perched here and there along the huge ridge of sand on the land side of Wallace Sands are the many others and new ones are being erected every year. On the ancient Wallace Farm, which extends from the northerly end of Wallace Sands, nearly to Odeorns Point, is a large and costly cottage erected by the late Professor James Parsons, Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, as a summer home, the place being now owned by his heirs. The Sagamore House at Foss Point, Little Harbor, as its commencement as a, in a one-story farmhouse of large area on the ground, built about 100 years ago by one of two brothers named Frost, who occupied adjoining farms at the point and from whom the point took its present name. These brothers one year got into a dispute over the ownership of a heifer valued at $5 carry the dispute into the courts and kept up a legal warfare until both contestants were ruined, the heifer having it, it is said in the meantime, grown to cowhood and finally died of old age, and both farms were sold to pay lawyers' fees and court expenses. A farm of 50 acres, including the point on which the Sagamore house later stood, was bought by Stephen Foy of Portsmouth, and the smaller farm, of 36 acres by his brother John Foy, the latter farm having since remained in the Foy name. By the usual custom, this change of ownership should have changed the name of the point to Foy's Point, but this change seems never to have taken place. In 1842, Stephen Foy sold his farm to a man named Odeon, but again no change of name resulted. There was already one Odeorns Point close 
by the name continued to be Frost's, as it had been during ownership by Mr. Ford. A few years later, Mr. Odeon, Mr. Odeon sold the place to Captain Thomas R. Clark, who about 1850, perhaps a year or two later, put the old farmhouse in complete repair and added another story to it, making it quite a large house. Built a bowling alley and opened the place as a summer resort. Much of Captain Clark's patronage came from Portsmouth, and even during the winter he entertained many sleighing parties. He was very popular personally, but he did not know how to keep a hotel, so as to make it pay, and it only so as to make it pay, and it only took him two or three years to find out when he gave up the attempt and sold the house and farm to Captain George W. Towell. Captain Towell conducted the house as a summer resort for two seasons, or three, and then concluded that he too was unlikely to accumulate a fortune as a hotel keeper. And from that time until 1868, the house was closed to the public. In that year, the place was bought by George W. and James S. Pierce, who greatly enlarged and improved the house and reopened it as a summer hotel. Colonel James S. Pierce, who assumed the entire control, was an experienced landlord, and under his management, the house enjoyed such a measure of success that in 1870, a large extension was built. But on June 12, 1871, the building caught fire while being made ready for the summer opening, and was totally consumed with the extension and a large stable, the only building to escape the flames being the bowling alley, which was at some distance from the house, and a, por a portion of which was afterwards fitted up as a dwelling and occupied by one of the owners for many years. The Pierce brothers estimated their loss at 60000 with $29,000 insurance they never rebuilt. About 1890, the place was bought by Dr. W. D. McKim of New York, who had erected for his own use as a summer home, not far from where the Sagamore House formerly stood, a large and handsome cottage. And it was one of the most beautiful situations along the coast. Towards the sea from the McKim Cottage is another handsome one, which Mrs. Martha M. Jones of New York had built for a summer residence and still near the sea, far out towards the end of Orion's Point, is the large and handsome cottage built some 30 years ago, or so ago for the Colonel Charles F. Eastman of Concord, New Hampshire, and now owned by his estate. Very large and handsome New Hummer summer homes at Rye Beach are those of Henry Dibley, George L. Allen, A. A. Carpenter, and Francis E. Drake, the latter one of the finest and most costly cottages on the New England coast, having been completed in 1903. Rye as a summer hotel town has perhaps reached its full growth, although it may be otherwise, but it has almost unlimited room for individual and family summer homes, and the number of these is certain to be on the increase for many years to come. All right, we've reached the end of chapters eight and nine. Thanks for visiting.